you have the ability to do a 500 pound deadlift and you can run a mile in five minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm like 170 right now. I had to put on a few pounds to get the 500 pound deadlift. What were the kind of weights that you hit in training most of the time compared to the 500 pound deadlift that you ended up doing? I don't think I ever did in training anything over like 435. Did building up the capacity to do that deadlift negatively affect any aspect of your ability to run well? I, I think if anything, it helps. Are there any like staple exercises that are gonna carry over into running? Outside of either deadlift or squat, like everything else is focused on just one leg specifically. I, I run like anywhere from 40 to 70 miles a week. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, just using strength training really to most of reduce your risk of injury so that I can run more. I like that it's standing. Yeah, dude. Never I, done a standing podcast. I couldn't imagine having this. Next time you come back, it's gonna be running. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we kind of did a that this morning. Yeah, we were. Yeah, a little walking treadmills. That that's possible. Yeah, walking treadmill. We can definitely do that. How many steps we get in a day, dude? I feel like I think way better when I'm out on a run. Like what today, about, like yeah, that's, that's true. It flows way better. Yeah. Well, I thought we ran like four and a half miles, and you're like, no, it was like seven. <laughs> yeah. I was like, damn. Lose track of time. I think what would be great is uh, if this was, um, if instead of just a, instead of just a standing podcast, is if it was a standing calf raise podcast. Mm. So you're in the machine and we're just here the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. So what do you think about that? And see, that's really interesting, right? What Greg Doucette said the other day. Why do you got to do that? Why do you got to use his name? <laughs> to like get you charged. <laughs> <laughs> I like Greg. Why are you looking so good today? <laughs> Why am I looking good? I mean, you always look good, but like, well, this is like freshly exceptional. shaved head. Is it for nice. Jeremy? Thank you. I had to, you know, I had to, you know, do <laughs> well for this guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I appreciate his fucking that. beautiful eyes and jaw of steel and shit. Like, dimples, yeah. Jesus, dimples, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on? <laughs> with Lucky all that? fiance, man. It's all the running. Oh, mm, that's all. That's my only. I don't know. Just chewing on gum all day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but real talk, you got like, <laughs> why did that, why is that happening? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's got genetics, I guess. I don't know. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know. It's a good question. <laughs> how long? I never uh, thought about it. How long you been running for? Uh, did you start running when you were young? No. I mean, you're 26, no. so you're fucking young. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was 21 when I started, so mm. five years ago. Oh, shit. Yeah. So not that long And not ago. much of a running background before that? No, I, I always hated running so much. So mm. was, I played sports. I played hockey and baseball. Uh, hockey? That's unusual. Hockey, yeah. In America? Yeah. In Wyoming, especially. There's like 10 teams in the whole state. It wow. is cold there, though. It is cold. We got mountains and ice. But uh, no, I always hated running because it was, it was punishment. In sports. So, like, I always had this really negative connotation with it mm -hmm. that, oh, if we're running, I did something wrong. And, uh, yeah, so I started in 2021. I, uh, I heard David Goggins on the Joe Rogan podcast. He told a story about running 100 miles and no training. And I thought, that that's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, at, at that point in my life, too, I felt like I was kind of lost or searching for something, too. Mm. And that just seemed like a really interesting thing to get into and mm -hmm. like a, a new way to challenge myself or explore my consciousness. And, uh, yeah. So I started running just like a mile a day. I, I would go as hard as I could every single day, just one mile full sprint. Uh, what kind of times idea? are you hitting yeah. at that? I yeah. mean, <laughs> I, the only baseline knowledge I had was in seventh grade, I ran a seven twelve mile. We had to run the mile in PE, wow. which is not bad for seventh That's grade. Good. That's really yeah. Good. yeah. And, uh, I was like, okay, as a 21 year old, as long as I can beat my seventh grade self, I'll just, mm. then I'll be good, right? And uh, mm. so I was just trying to beat seven twelve every day. I think I maybe got down to like six thirty. I don't think I ever broke six minutes. And that's uh, crazy. And like, now my, mar my now my marathon change. time is like my marathon pace is like six ten, six fifteen a mile. Mm. So which is it's that's absurd to me. But yeah, I did just a mile a day for probably like four or five months, and then learned like okay, if I want to go farther, I probably have to slow down a little bit, maybe mm -hmm. learn how to train properly, but. The first two years, uh, I'm kind of stubborn and I don't, I don't like doing a lot of research. At, at least then I didn't like doing a lot of research and actually learning how to do it. I just wanted to figure it out on my own. Yeah. I probably could have fast tracked it and, and made a lot more progress a lot quicker, but I was so stubborn that I'm like, I'm just going to figure this out on my own. And so I, I started learning just slowing down. Okay, well, let's run like nine minutes a mile. So I could do like four or five miles. And then uh, I think within the first year, I worked my way up to about 10 miles uh, I did like one 10 mile run and it felt like, 
I was out there forever. It felt like a marathon. Mm -hmm. But hitting that like double digit gave me so much confidence. But uh, yeah, we've done a lot since then, in between now and then. But uh, no, long story short, definitely did not have a background in running. What did you? Uh, what do you think it does for you from a mental side of things? Because you did mention that maybe you felt a little lost for a while. Yeah, I feel like it. It's a, a place of solitude for sure. Like you get to just think and meditate. Back then, I, I would listen to music. I, I couldn't go for a run without music. Um, now I don't listen to anything. I just go out and, and have my thoughts, basically. But uh, yeah, it's just a place to think and and be by yourself. I feel like, especially with phones and technology, we're rarely within, or we're, we're rarely just by ourselves with our own thoughts. And so I think it's important to have that. Um, and I think it's a it's a really tangible way to build self confidence. Like it, it, you, you're building like this undeniable evidence for yourself that, okay, if I show up and do this every single day, I can actually progress and get better at something. And um, yeah, I think just any physical endeavor is a good way to, to do that. And and yeah, it's a very tangible way to just make progress with yourself. So I, I think self-confidence was one of the biggest things. Um, yeah. You're doing a workout yesterday and you're one of those rare runners that like lifts and runs and you can you can tell with the way you look too. So is that something that you had while running at the beginning or did you realize later on that you need strength training with what you're doing right now? Yeah, uh, definitely more of the latter. Okay. Uh, I I lifted very unintentionally for a while. I, I, I started lifting when I was like 15, 16 in high school. I just had like a, a conditioning class. Mm -hmm. um, I was never any good at it. Like I couldn't lift crazy weights or anything. And then after I got out of high school, I would I would just go to the gym like four or five times a week. I would just do machines. I'd do like kind of bodybuilding style stuff. Yeah. Uh, just really as a way to, to try and stay active and stay healthy. Um, but I got kind of bored with it because I wasn't making a ton of progress. Again, I was stubborn. So I didn't, I didn't want to like <laughs> take the time to research and like, okay, how do I actually get bigger and stronger? I just thought I could figure it out. Um, and then when I started running a little bit more, uh, again, I just kind of just a way to, to stay healthy. And again, like trying to learn something else about myself. I, uh, I got injured a lot because I had like shin splints. I had runner's knee, plantar fasciitis, all these weird little nagging things all the time. Mm -hmm. What's um, runner's knee specifically? Uh, there's a more scientific term for it, but from what I know, it's, it's the like cartilage in your knee. Okay. I think it's where your femur meets your kneecap. Um, there's something in there that like gets broken down gotcha. like, tissue wise. Um, so I had all these things that just kept popping up and I was like, okay, there's gotta be a way to, to avoid these. And so I started finally doing more research, learning about strength training, how it can help with running, not only be a better, faster runner, but also reducing your risk of injury. And so now, now I lift cause I, uh, lifting feels good. I love lifting. I love the way it makes you feel, uh, and healthy and, it, you know, metabolically makes you healthy too. But, um, more so just for like helping running, I think. I think, again, reducing risk of injury and, and building muscular endurance so you can run longer. I love doing the longer stuff with running because yeah. uh, I feel like you can learn more about yourself through the longer distances. I think the shorter distances are fun, but uh, I, I prefer the longer stuff. And, and the longer stuff is just more wear and tear on your body. So that's where the strength training comes into, into play even more. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, just using strength training really to mostly reduce your risk of injury so that I can run more. Yeah, I'm sure you've noticed that you're strength relative to your body weight is a really big factor and you're not a heavy guy and you're also deadlifting like 500 pounds <laughs> yeah. yeah you're handling some heavy weight so that probably uh is something that makes you more durable than your average runner right yeah because from what i know of strength training is is the more you lift the uh, the stronger bone density you have for the more bone density and right you know that helps reduce your your risk of stress fractures um you know you build up all that connective tissue in your knees and in your joints uh again reducing your risk of injury for for running but yeah i'm, I'm like 170 right now uh i had to put on a few pounds to get the 500 pound deadlift um or it seemed like i had to put on some weight so i got up not a lot it was like 175 so just five pounds heavier but i've always had such a hard time putting on weight and so going even from 170 to 175 within it took like three or four months of, of mm. intentionally putting on weight that like I had to eat so much food. You're doing a real deadlift. You know, oh, here it, we go. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, oh yeah, real man deadlift. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. Like the things that each individual has to work for versus the things that they don't have to work for. You know, you mentioned putting on five pounds. Like, you know, I can put on five pounds by eating a sandwich. Yeah. You know, I can <laughs> put on five pounds super easy. Right. Um, 
I don't even remember the last time I weighed 175. I was probably like, I don't know, like 13 or something like that. You know, it's probably a long ass time ago. Um, But like for you, running came pretty naturally. Like you ran and without a whole lot of training, um, you ran like in gym class, you ran like a seven minute mile. And then later on you ran like a six. So it's just, it's it's interesting because in the fitness industry, we're sharing information a lot of times with people and we don't know where someone's starting out. Mm. And sometimes people look at us or they'll look to us for discipline, motivation. And what they might not realize is that maybe in the track of life, like we started off like a lap or two ahead of right. some people in, in some of these areas. And so I think it's just important for people to kind of keep that in mind when they're listening to where some of us started out or some of the recommendations that we might have. No, oh, 100%. And I think we naturally gravitate towards what we're good at. Like, uh, I think you, like being younger, you saw you were more gifted in lifting or you had more inherent strength mm-hmm. than like your friends or your or people around you. And so I think that's important to note is like, I think we naturally kind of go towards what we're, what we're good at. Like my bench sucks, my squat sucks, but I learned I was pretty good at deadlifting. So I was like, okay, how can I lean into that and try and get my deadlift up to a decent number and, and still, again, trying to get my run faster uh, because I learned that I'm decent at running. Um, but yeah, that's an important point that like, you know, you, you take a snapshot of somebody and you think, oh, they, they've put in all this work. I mean, yeah, they probably have put in the work at some point, but uh, yeah, some people might start a little bit ahead of others. And uh, like, if I were to try and make a transition to powerlifting, like it'd take me way longer because I'm not maybe naturally gifted in that realm. Uh, same not thing like for a you. predisposition. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Same thing like you with running, maybe it feels more unnatural. You have to think yeah. about it more. Like even this morning when we we're running, you asked me about like my form. Like I've never really thought about my form. I just do what feels good. And I think naturally I have a better running form. Wow. Same thing maybe with you with, with lifting is like, you never really had to think too much about it. You would just do it. That was a question they had with Anderson Silva. Like they were at his house uh, in Brazil and they were like, how did this all come to be? He's like, I don't know. I never really thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I started jujitsu when I was like five. Yeah. Yeah. And, I've, I, <laughs> and he just destroyed everybody, you know? That's crazy. Yeah. And I've always been super active. Like I'm definitely grateful my parents got me into sports when I was, so basically as soon as I started walking, I started playing hockey. Uh, and hockey is obviously a very unnatural sport because whenever in nature are you skating on ice with, with <laughs> knives on your feet? <laughs> and so uh, learning that and just like, you know, the balance and like hockey is kind of similar to running where it's like a single leg activity. You're, you're always balancing on one leg. It requires a lot of stability. So I think that that probably translated pretty well. Demonstrating on Andrew, can you show us like when they pull the <laughs> shirt, the jersey up over yeah, and over. they throw like the uppercuts on the guy? Yeah, I wish uh, in high school they make you wear face masks, like the like a full cage. So there's not a lot of fighting, but like, it's like- Is yeah, there some at least? There's some. It's like, I'd call it, I don't know if I'd call it fighting. It's like, you're kind of just like wrestling with people. Like you'll throw punches, but you have gloves on and they have a face mask the on. The fact that you're still throwing yeah. punches and they're okay with it in <laughs> yeah. high school is wild to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a wild sport. It's a very- In the NHL, like, like, they, they separate. You know, they, they yeah. skate away from each other for half a second and they go, yeah. and they throw their gloves off. <laughs> yep. That's how they throw their gloves off. They just go bam yeah. like that. And then they, they fucking go at it. Yeah. And now in the NHL, they make people wear the like half visor, the yeah. half like uh, whatever it is, the glass mm-hmm. thing uh, to try and reduce fighting, which kind of sucks because that's such a draw of the sport. <laughs> is it? Yeah. So, but I mean, still people are fighting. You know, they'll, they'll slam their, their bare knuckles into mm. like a fiberglass visor, which is crazy. But yeah, hockey players are wild. It, uh, I think that sport definitely taught me a lot in terms of just grit and and kind of that work to reward. It's fucking cold. Relationship. <laughs> right? yeah, and it's cold. <laughs> I mean, I've gone to a bunch of hockey games. It was pretty popular uh, in my high school. And I'd freeze my ass off just going to the games. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, it's like it's like going out for a run in the cold, though. Hmm. Like maybe the first you couple of minutes, yeah. you might be chilly, but you get used to it. And you have all the gear on, all the pads and everything. So, hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's a... Uh, it's a, a team sport, but it also requires so much grit mm-hmm. at the same time. So, yeah, I'm biased, but that's, that's definitely it doesn't a doesn't really, sport. You don't really hear people talk that much about hockey, but hockey players are extremely athletic. They're also massive. I think that sometimes people don't realize how big some of these athletes are. Like a lot of the NHL yeah. guys are pretty big. They also play a ton of games. I want to say they play like 80 games or something like that. Yeah, it's the same as the NBA. 
Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, because it's such a physical sport. Yeah. And it's, uh, hockey players are like big. They're not like shredded. Like they're, they're mm-hmm. not very lean because it's just, it's a very power sport. It's kind of like powerlifting, I guess. Like you don't, there's no benefit to being like really lean. Like you just want to be big and strong, but also agile and fast. Uh, yeah. It's a fun sport. I definitely miss it. Um, I think uh, I've noticed like in my training for running, I think a lot of the workouts that I'm, I'm better at are like, Yesterday, we did some 400-meter repeats. You know, it's like a minute, 15 seconds per rep, just going as hard as you can. In hockey, it's kind of the same thing where it's like a 45 to 60-second shift. You're just going as hard as you can for a short period of time, then you mm-hmm. go rest. So I feel like with running, that kind of helps too, like that that same aerobic system of like these short spurts uh, and, and these like intervals, basically. But So that was a hard transition for myself because uh, I was always good at the shorter distance stuff because of the like high intensity sports, but then trying to transition into the endurance side of things like a marathon or like a 50 mile. It's like a totally different system that you're working. Is there anything specific with hockey where you train your legs in a particular way uh, for skating and to reduce injury? Like I'm just kind of thinking like, I mean, it seems like your groin would get kind of beat up, your adductors and stuff like yeah. that would get beat up from a sport like that. Yeah, I wish I had a good answer because I that was before I was like really intentional and cared about a lot of this mm. stuff. Like, I feel like I just kind of relied on my natural abilities and, and just like the fact that I played since I was two years old. Uh, Cause I, unfortunately, like one of my best friends in, in high school, we were on the JV team freshman year. And then by the senior year, he was like already off playing somewhere else. He went and played D1 hockey. But, mm. and you know, when we were 15 years old, we were at the same skill level. But the only difference was he would show up and put in more hours than mm. me. He would like work out after practice. He'd go to the gym several times a week. He'd be at home like messing with a stick and and uh, a puck. And I just never did that. Like I would just show up and do the bare minimum <laughs> at the time. And mm-hmm. so I got by, but uh, I feel like that just seeing somebody else show up and put in the work, I was like, okay, he doesn't have some genetics or something that I don't have. It's just mm. he showed up and worked harder than I did. Uh, so yeah, I, I try and take that into running now too. Like, damn, if I if I would have trained like this back then, like I could have maybe gone and played D one sports or mm-hmm. uh, gone beyond that. But yeah, let me ask you this, man. Because for example, you you have the ability to do a 500, uh, 500 pound deadlift, and you can run a mile in five minutes. Do you did you find because a lot of people are kind of uh, they're against doing a lot of the big compound movements now, especially when it comes to those movements and sports or th- anything that has to do with gait. Did building up the capacity to do that deadlift, did it negatively affect any aspect of your ability to run well? Did you find, or are you finding that mm-hmm. it is negatively impacting anything that you can tell so far? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think if anything, it helps. Okay. Uh, I mean, deadlift obviously is focused on the posterior chain. Mm-hmm. And I think in my experience, most of the deficiencies in runners or in myself is is stemmed from the posterior chain, like weak glutes specifically. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I think even if you have runner's knee or you have some issue with your knee or something, a lot of it can be root, can be stemmed back to your your glutes. And so, um, yeah, I think if anything, it helps. Okay. And and I like, I still do a lot of functional movements. Like yesterday we did like a bunch of lunges, box step ups, Bulgarian split squats, trying to do as many single leg things as I can. Mm-hmm. But the deadlift, I don't squat a whole lot, like just, you know, back, like regular back squat, but the deadlift specifically seems like it, helps with running. Um, I think it's just a posterior chain activation. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you use your hamstrings a lot when you run, use your glutes a lot. Um, and then even maybe with like posture, having like a strong back probably helps a lot with running. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it, in my experience, it hasn't had any negative effects. At some point, it might make your ass so big that it slows you down. <laughs> yeah. You know? my, uh, uh, my girlfriend, she does say I got a big butt. So. She likes it. <laughs> She's into the deadlifts. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Uh, and there is a point of diminishing returns yeah. with size and running. Like, if I'm trying to really optimize, like, my marathon time, I'm probably not in the ideal body composition right now. I'd probably have to lose some weight or some size. But I don't know if I'm really trying to optimize my marathon time. Like, I, I want to just be able to run fast and lift heavy at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, I think not only does it make me feel good, but based on what I know from science, like, that's the, the healthiest way to train is, like, do some zone 2 cardio, do some high-intensity cardio uh, and then lift heavy things a few times a week. So I, I'm probably running more than like the optimal in terms of like overall health and longevity because I, I run like anywhere from 40 to 70 miles a week depending mm-hmm. on what I'm training for. But uh, I think over time, you can build up that tolerance to it to where now like doing 50 miles a week doesn't really feel like much, which mm-hmm. is cool. Cool. 
you just enjoy it. So like, yeah, you, I just like you, it. Even if it's like, like you're saying, like it might not be the most optimal thing for like health longevity, but you're like, fuck it. I just, I like it. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it's doing anything negative. Right. I, I can tell if I get over, if I get over 50 or 60 miles for too many weeks, I start to feel it. Uh, but that baseline has also shifted up as I get more fit and as I get more accustomed to running. So like, I remember my first 50 mile week was just like a year and a half ago. And that felt like so many miles. Uh, and then now I think I'll probably hit like 50 miles this week and it doesn't really feel like much. So I think your body just becomes more attuned to it. Uh, and maybe even like, you know, the elite marathon guys who run, you know, hundred miles a week for years, like it might seem crazy, but to their bodies, they're so adapted and accustomed to it that it's probably not that bad for them potentially. Um, I don't know. Yeah, there's. I think everybody's just so different and so subjective to to where you're at in your in your fitness and you know how your genetics are. All these different things. There's so many factors at play to like set a number and say, okay, if you run over this many miles a week, it's gonna ruin your health. It's it's so subjective. Yeah. Pat Project family, we love beef on this podcast. We talk about it a lot. All right, we love our meat. But sometimes eating the same meat all the time can get a little bit boring. That's why we partnered with Good Life Proteins, which also has certified Piedmontese on their website. But sometimes you might just want to eat some chicken or fish or duck. (laughs) Duck? Who eats duck? But you can eat duck. That's why if you go to goodlifeproteins.com, you can select their Build-A-Box options and input all the proteins you want. Then you'll select subscribe and save to save money on all of your meat. If you enter code power project at checkout, you can save up to 25% on your subscription. That means you're going to be saving 25% on all of that different meat that's going to be heading to your door. Once again, head to goodlifeproteins.com. You can enter code power project and save up to 25%. Links are in the description box below, as well as the podcast show notes. Um, when it comes to like hard stuff, you were mentioning earlier that you kind of wish you pushed yourself a little bit more when you were younger. And then you said you like to kind of adopt some of this into um, your running nowadays and, and kind of pushing what, what, like, uh, that's, that's a tough spot to be in. Sometimes we were talking about this a little bit on the run. I agree. Like doing hard things is important. Um, I think a lot of people heard Andrew Huberman and David Goggins talking about how your mind can literally grow and expand when you do novel things that are difficult. And when you really push into stuff that, that maybe like we like running, right. But you have to make the running probably fairly uncomfortable at the same time, how do you make it uncomfortable, but not so uncomfortable that you can't recover from it? You know what I mean? Like there's, yeah. there's a lot of things to think about. Um, and just going for it feels good. And the expansion of the mind and, and what that does for you and the runner's high and like all these things feel so good. Uh, but sometimes it can be to our detriment in terms of like body breaking down and stuff. Like what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's like the million dollar question. <laughs> like, how do you get the the mental stimulus out of running without overdoing it and and destroying your body? Um, I don't know if there's like a really a, like one hard answer to that. I I, th- I think uh, I like doing things maybe in like spurts or in like sprints. So like if I if I go and set a goal like the most recent marathon I did, I want to run under two hours forty five minutes. So I set the goal to run that. Training wise, like I probably was kind of always towing that line of overtraining and and maybe causing an injury or something. Uh, and when I would start to feel that just through intuition, uh, I'd maybe like, okay, instead of doing 10 miles a day, I'll do like eight and just pull back a little bit. So I think maybe the answer would be to, to find that intuition and, and find that, uh, that point with your body where you might be overdoing it. But I, I almost think that to some extent you have to push beyond that occasionally to really know where you're, where that line is at, because like the first race I ever did was, uh, it was a 12 hour endurance challenge in Wyoming through the mountains. So you had 12 hours to just do as many miles as you could. And I'd want to do 50 miles at the time. I was maybe running like 10 miles a week. So severely undertrained. And, uh, I ended up doing 43 miles, but I, my, my knee hurt afterwards. Uh, like I got runner's knee, so I had to stop early. Um, and so that was like, I pushed too far, but now I'm like, okay, now I can go back. I got to heal up from this obviously. And I can go back and say, okay, maybe I'll do like 30 miles next time. Or I can, it's like you set a new baseline for yourself. Um, so I think there is maybe some value in occasionally crossing that line uh, to really find where your limit might be. 
but I don't know how often you actually want to do that. There, there's there's probably two ways to go about it. Either that way or just kind of playing it safe and like always being maybe under your true potential. But I don't know if you really want to live like that. I think I'd rather occasionally cross over that line and and see like, okay. How do you know if you'll come back safely though? Yeah, that's true. That's, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a risk, I guess, you're, that you had to be willing to take. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm training for a hundred mile race in June. Why? And that, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to, I want to find out why okay. <laughs> in the process. Okay. Is this your first one, right? First one. Yeah. The longest wow. I've gone before this, um, was a hundred K, which I did in a parking lot, uh, like a month and a half Damn. ago. Yeah. That was, would not recommend that. Uh, hundred or it was 62 miles. So hundred kilometers. Just going uh, around in a circle. Around a one mile loop. So 62 Dude, that's laps. that's evil. Okay, Ew. Here's a, I made this. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, That's there's some, some there's some footage. Yeah. Uh the original race we were signing or that I signed up for uh got canceled like three days before. Mm-hmm. But there was like a hundred of us planning to run this. And so like, okay, let's just adapt and pivot and we'll just make up our own race. And somebody knew somebody at this church. So they're like, let's just use the parking lot. We'll set up a one mile course. Some people did a hundred miles, uh because wow. they were training to run the hundred mile version of the race that got canceled. And uh yeah. It was uh it, it that to me was the hardest thing mentally that I've done in like a physical endeavor, um, because the sixty two miles it was nine and a half hours, just oh. the same one mile loop over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Like it, it kind of my brain turned into mush almost. <laughs> like because as soon as I would kind of start to forget about a part of the loop, I would already be back to that point. Yeah, and so I never really forgot about anything. It was just kind of this one long continuous. Loop. To what, the best, oh, go ahead. To the best of your ability, can you kind of explain what the fuck happens to your mind when you're just doing something like that over and over and over and over? Were you listening to music? Were you no, no, no? I never listen to music. Okay. I love I love just seeing where my mind goes, uh, and th- that's why I like running to begin with. Is yes, it's a great way to stay healthy and, and keep yourself physically fit. But I love the mental side of things, and that's why I like doing ultra marathons. That's why I like you know, signing up for these crazy long races and I'm doing a hundred miles later this year, but, um, it's really hard to explain, um, what I, I, I think you have to be present the whole time. That's one really powerful thing that I've learned is you can't, your mind just won't wander that far because as soon as you kind of start to let it wander, you're instantly snapped back to, okay, we're running. This is very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Why are we doing this? And you're just kind of always in the present moment. And so, it's like, to me, that's like, I've never found anything that, that makes me, thank you. I've never found anything that makes me more present yeah. than, than running. And um, I like that a lot. And it teaches you so much patience. Like when I have 62 <laughs> laps to run and I'm on like the eighth lap, if I start thinking about, fuck, I have like 50 more of these things to do, <laughs> like it, that'll screw you up and you'll probably, you might end up quitting. So yeah. um, again, that, also forces you to be present. Okay, just focus on the lap we're currently on. Focus on what we're doing right now. Um, I've also, I've done some like things with like psilocybin and mushrooms. And I feel like, in my experience, uh, like a, a mushroom trip or a psychedelic trip is almost identical to, you don't get like the visualizations yeah. like, during an ultra marathon, but that part of your brain that gets rewired, I feel like it's almost identical. Mm. And, and I've heard Huberman, um, he didn't compare running and endurance events with psilocybin but he talks about how it's our brains are plastic and you can rewire your brain through like a traumatic experience or or through psychedelics and uh, i feel like long distance endurance events kind of have that same effect trauma yeah okay yeah yeah pushing yourself through something that's difficult and at some point you sometimes maybe think you think you're not going to be okay yeah you know? and you have to kind of convince yourself or talk yourself into like no this is what we train for this should be fine. Yeah. But we are kind of, uh, we're, we're crossing the line a little bit today. Yeah, because you, you dip into like that survival mode a little bit, I think. And that that fight or flight response, it gets triggered. And uh, and you just really start asking yourself, why the heck am I doing this? Especially if it's a voluntary thing, like I didn't have to run 100 kilometers in a parking lot. But um, when it's a voluntary thing, that's when you really start asking yourself why you're doing these things. And like, what, what the hell am I doing out here? And I think that's powerful because um, you can take that and, and translate it into to everyday life, which is cool. You uh, share a lot of ideas and concepts back and forth with uh, Pete Rubish, right? Pete's the man. And does he help you with lifting and stuff too? Yeah, so I worked with him 
uh, he's so good of a coach that I only needed him for nine weeks <laughs> because I, my, uh, my goal to do the 500 pound deadlift and the sub five mile, um, I've always kind of had that in the back of my head, but I never actually took the tra- the time to train for it. Um, and so I think it was like October, as soon as I finished my, my marathon, I started working with him. Uh, at the time, I think my deadlift was like 435. I could never get anything, uh, above yeah. that. And then, so within nine weeks, went from 435 to 500 pounds. So pretty big jump percentage wise, uh, within, you know, less than three months, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. Uh, Pete's the man. He, he knows so much about health and fitness and powerlifting and even like blood work. He's obsessed with blood work and yeah. any questions I have about that kind of stuff, I'll just text him. He, he knows the answer, which is pretty cool. Um, he helped me a ton with deadlifting though. Like the technique and uh, honestly, even more so just like building the confidence that I could pull more weight than I thought I could. Like he'd program, say it was like, he had me do, it was like a 20 rep thing at like 300 pounds and I was like I, I, there's no fucking way I could do that but I did it, it it's just like having that person there to tell me and encourage me that I could do it and um yeah I think that's the power of a coach is they're, they're gonna like tell you to go to do something that you probably wouldn't normally do under your own volition and so having that external factor or that external presence to kind of push you I think was a big thing and, and again technique wise he helped me a lot too that's like a high volume runner because that's like your main thing um for any runner that's listening, how, you you know, when an athlete does multiple sports, sometimes they feel that they're too tired to actually do anything with lifting. You know, Mm. there's a lot of people who grapple who are like, ugh, lifting just takes so much energy. So how is it that you're able to figure out how to balance these during the week so that you still have really good running sessions and the lifting doesn't get in the way of your performance as a runner? Yeah, it took a long time to build up to that. Okay. Uh, I think if you took a snapshot of this week, like yesterday we did an eight mile speed workout and then went and trained legs pretty intensely for okay. an hour. Uh, I definitely could have done that like a year or two ago, but it just taking a lot of time to really intentionally build up to that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so before I, I really, so I went from just lifting uh, like four or five times a week, you know, like bodybuilding, just machines and stuff to then not lifting at all and really just running. Cause I thought to be a better runner, I need to be smaller, I need to lose weight strength training is going to be bad for a runner mm. uh, to then now doing both of them. So I had like some experience doing both individually, but trying to combine those, um, it definitely just took a lot of time. Uh, I think eating, obviously, like just making sure you're getting enough calories yeah. is probably the most tactical thing you can do because uh, running is obviously a very calorically demanding activity. Like I think today a seven mile run and an hour probably burned close to a thousand calories. And so making sure you're, you're replenishing those and, um, I'm almost always probably still in a deficit, but intentionally trying to get in enough calories so that you can sustain that energy. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I mean, sleep is obviously huge. What you're eating is huge. Uh, I think I think there's all these little things you can do to yeah. help with the balance of the two. But I think more than anything, it's just giving your body enough time to to build those adaptations to be able to handle that much volume because. If I'm doing 60 miles a week, that's probably eight to 10 hours of running and then tack on another four or five hours of lifting a week. I mean, that's... So is that like, what, two or three lifting sessions? Uh, I keep the lifting sessions pretty short. Um, It's usually like 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. So it's not very long. Um, I lift usually four times a week. So two lower body and then two upper body. Mm -hmm. And again, as a runner, you don't really need the upper body, but I like to feel good and look good. So why not? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's 10 to 15 hours a week of training, which which can definitely be a lot. And again, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that just a couple of years ago. So just really taking the time to let my body adapt to that mm-hmm. seems to be the biggest thing. Uh, we've been talking about deadlifts and I, I know you're a fan of lunges as well, but are there any like staple exercises for a, as a runner that you like, you kind of, they're like your staple movements that are going to carry over into running? Like, have you discovered anything mm-hmm. like that? Yeah, uh, I think anything single leg where you, you, it doesn't have to be literally on one leg, but at least loading one leg at a time. So like Bulgarian split squats are, are probably one of my favorites. I love box step-ups. I think box step-ups are the most, the closest simulation to, especially like mountain running. Like if you're going up a mountain uh, or going up a big hill, cause you're like getting that upward movement, that drive. Um, I like I love doing lunges, uh, whether it's like dumbbell, kettlebell, barbell any kind of lunges because that's still, you're loading up one leg at a time. You're in that functional, like you're using your knees, ankles, hips, all those main joints you're using when running. Uh, yeah, when I, when I realized that running 
was a single leg activity, mm-hmm. my like whole mind was blown. Cause I'm like, <laughs> shit, that's so true. Like I never thought of it that way that you're never on both feet at the same time when you're running. So why would you train, uh, with both feet on the ground or, or with your weight evenly distributed on both feet. And so, um, outside of either deadlift or squat, like everything else is focused on just one leg specifically. Um, and I, again, I think just getting used to being balanced on one leg, having that load, uh, and just teaching yourself how to have stability and, and have that balance is huge. Um, yeah. And I think through those like more functional movements, you kind of hit all those like smaller muscles that are in there. Cause mm-hmm. I, I don't really do a lot of like calf raises or like, I know a lot of people do the tib raises. Um, that probably would have helped maybe early on when I was doing those shin splints. Yeah. But I feel like through the more functional movements, I kind of am working all those same muscles and those same systems too. So yeah, I, I tr- really try to focus on single leg things as much as I can. Okay. When you were getting ready for that deadlift and you were, uh, trying to improve your deadlift to get to 500 pounds from 435. Um, what were the kind of weights that you hit in training most of the time compared to the 500 pound deadlift that you ended up doing? Yeah. Um, I have to look back at my training specifically. I remember I would do like 405 for about five reps. Um, and one interesting thing that uh, I learned from Pete was like, you don't really need a lot of sets. Like I think most deadlifting sessions, it was like two to three sets most days. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a ton of volume. All, all the volume came in terms of the weight. Or yeah, the two or three weight. main sets. Obviously, there's like little warm-ups and stuff like that. But right. once you get to your top set, it's like you do one to maybe three top sets, right? Right. Yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, the war- I learned the warm-up sets. Like that's... You don't really count those on paper. Right. But that is a way of, of building up to it. So, um, yeah, I remember we would do a lot of like sets of four or five around like 385. Um, yeah, I think... I don't think I ever did in training anything over like 435 and that was for like two reps maybe. Everything else was kind of in this percentage from I, I would guess maybe like 70 to 80 percent. Was that quite a bit different than the way that you were training previously uh, to get to the oh, 435? Yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. You'd always go, to, <laughs> you'd always go 405, 425, those yep. ranges, which are represents too large of a percentage to really make improvements. Yep. Um, just to explain it to people a little bit further, there's just uh, in real general basic terms, there's something called like a technical limit. And I believe that when you're power lifting, that it, your your uh, best bet is to keep your form uh, as clean as you can. There's There's a little bit of room to have some disruption in your form, but your form should be pretty smooth and clean. And when you can perform the reps correctly uh, with the... With, uh, you know, weights that are near maximal, like th- those are good, clean reps. And those reps will now register as like a real positive for your body. If you go to do a rep and you round over a ton and you shake a lot and you kind of barely make it to the top, it's not that that, that, uh, that type of work won't have any benefit for you. It's just can be difficult to recover from. So if you do it from one week to the next, to the next and so on, a lot of times you run into injury or the body just simply doesn't want to uh, get better because you're kind of lifting in a f- slightly fatigued state each time and all you can muster up every time is that exact same weight. But if you train under that um, and you train with 385 rather than 415 or something like that, you'll have cleaner reps. You might be able to do three sets of two reps. So now you did six really clean reps. And the next time that you go to train, that work was inputted into your body, into your central nervous system. And the body then kind of says, hey, you did a good job with that shit. We're going we're gonna to count that. You're going to get a little stronger. It kind of reminds me of like being in school uh, with math. They would say like, show me your work. How'd you get to this answer? And how you get to your weight in strength training is the most important thing. That you have to be able to show a certain amount of work. If your work was sloppy, doesn't count. Not yeah. not the same. Yeah, that was something I actually realized was I, I probably had the strength to pull 500 pounds even before working with Pete, you know, when I had a 435 PR, but I just didn't have one, the right technique and probably my nervous system wasn't, uh, wasn't like attuned to, mm-hmm. to being able to pull that much weight. And even just like mentally being comfortable with that pull up off the ground and like, cause it's a very uncomfortable feeling when you've got that much weight in your hands. Like everything feels like it's about to burst. Like just getting mentally comfortable with that. Cause I, I always, you know, everybody talks about, oh, deadlifting is bad for your back. 
you know, I start getting the weight heavier and I'm like, oh, I don't blow out my spine or something. Mm -hmm. And just being comfortable with like, okay, we can, we can handle it um, within reason, obviously. But uh, yes, so probably I had the inherent strength, just had to, to put all those puzzle pieces together. And it's kind of the same thing with running. Like so much of it is your, your nervous system and, and getting your mind comfortable with those really uncomfortable paces. Like if you're training for a marathon and you got to hold in my case, a 6.15 pace for 26 miles, mm. that's nearly a sprint, basically. <laughs> and be, but being able to hold that and be comfortable mentally with that for two hours and 45 minutes, that's one of the biggest things. Uh, and so, like, in training with running, you spend a lot of time, I'll do, like, mile repeats at my marathon pace, which is like, okay, now I got to do that 26 times. It doesn't make sense on paper. But being able to just build that, that um kind of like cruise control almost with your mind and, and being able to get your body just comfortable at those paces. Uh, even though you probably have the fitness already, you just got to, again, make sure it's all on the same page. What's your heart rate at when you're try, like keeping those types of paces? Oh, it's uh my average heart rate when I did the 244 marathon was like 181. So, that was your average heart rate? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it progressively gets higher throughout. So the first maybe half marathon mm -hmm. average is maybe like low 170s. Yeah. And then as you get more fatigued, your effort level increases. Uh, so the last like six miles is just like, I'm breathing really hard. Mm -hmm. Everything just is depleted at that point. Um, and so overall, I, I mean, towards the end of the marathon, it's probably like high 180s. Yeah. Uh, but overall, on average, it's it's like 181, mm. which is which is pretty nuts. Is there any consensus on like what's, what would be, I guess, deemed as healthy for X amount of time? Like is, mm. has anyone kind of figured out like, hey, you know, 180 is like kind of a lot and you probably shouldn't be in that range for more than like an hour, you know, or, or 30 yeah. minutes or something. I've heard pe like, people comment on my videos and say stuff like that. Like, dude, you should let your heart rate get that high for that long. Like, that can't be good for your heart. But I mean, like, I'm okay now. I feel good. Like my resting heart rate's really low. It's like yeah. in the 40s typically. So um, yeah, I don't I don't know if there's like a hard number. Like it, say, you can't let your heart rate be over 170 for a certain amount of time. Um I think there's like, I think your your mind will probably stop you for, before you reach a point where you're going to, you know, cause physical damage to yourself. Like when I was doing my VO2 max test about a month ago, uh, my heart rate got up, I think it was like 188, 189, like high 180s. Uh, and my mind stopped before my body did. Like I didn't pass out. Uh, I, I like I've I consciously hit the stop button on the treadmill because that was what I thought was my my limitation. Mm. Um, so I think I don't think that's anything you have to be worried about when it comes to heart rate. I think I think your mind will always tap out before your body does. Yeah, I'm not educated enough quite a bit on this topic, but the small amount that I have heard and small amount that I do know, it does seem like. It does seem like you can do some damage, so it might be something to look into. Okay. It might be something to look into a little bit more because I think just as somebody who's like resting on the couch and not, you know, not being active, uh, they may be damaging their heart uh, with inactivity. We can also exhaust our heart a little bit uh, too much too. And you uh, you might kind of be like with, with your skill set, you might be the perfect candidate for somebody that can almost like outrun their heart a little bit. Right. So it might be something to think about because, okay. but I know you do yeah. train, you, you train in a very intelligent way and you aren't typically in those higher ranges. That's mainly just for a race and stuff like that, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like twice a year. That right, happen. right, right. And so I mean, that is probably a good point of like, I mean, you can't be doing that all the time. I, I don't think anybody should right. be running that intensely all the time. Uh, but I try to do a big effort like that maybe once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. And so maybe... I mean, your heart's a muscle and obviously you're, you're building up the efficiency to it. And um, I mean, there's probably a point in which your muscle will just straight up fail, like your bicep or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know, I guess enough about that. But in my experience, I, at least, I, my, my, my opinion, I guess, is that my mind would tell me to stop or mm -hmm. would force me to stop before my body would. But um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point though. We, uh, it's important to red line here and there, I think. So. Yeah, yeah. And it, it feels good sometimes, I think, too. <laughs> it like, does. To get into that that state mentally where you're just like, you can't push any farther, or you don't think you can at least. I think I think there's some value to that oh, yeah. for mental reasons. Do you know that you're going to be able to finish when you're in that zone? Or are you, is it kind of 
it's kind of sketchy you think in your head or you're like man i'm not quite sure about this um like would that be like the end of a marathon or something yeah yeah um yeah i guess you don't ever really fully know going and, pretty hard and you're like yeah. yeah i think i got like three or four miles left and the mile marker comes and you actually have five more miles left and you're like all right let's yeah. just i will just see what happens <laughs> I, I haven't i haven't reached a point where i can't keep going so that's yeah that's great that's something cool is like I think there's there's still so much untapped potential, which mm. is fun. And and with running, is like you can always run faster, you can always go farther. Um, so I've I've yet to reach a point where my body just stops. Like I mean, I might cramp up maybe, or like you know your your legs uh, have so much lactic acid build up or something that like they just literally won't move any faster. Mm. But I, I've personally not reached that point yet. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I, I do like during workouts to just to kind of go into the well a little bit and like reach that point for a couple minutes. Uh, and that's once a week. Like the, the like I, I train the 80, 20 rule. So 80% of the time is very, very easy. Like we ran today zone two, uh, just super chill conversational. And then the other 20% is more intense doing intervals. Um, but that's such a small percentage. Sounds like you need to train with Jason Kalipa every once in a while. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> he loves all that stuff. He loves going crazy. Yeah, it's fun to, to go fast like that and push yourself, but it's just not sustainable. And I, I have learned like over time, like the more resilience my body builds up, I can handle more of the high intensity stuff. But uh, I think in the long run, that 80-20 balance seems to be the best because the, the reason zone two works so well is because it just allows you to show up the next day. Mm -hmm. Like your effort level is so low. You're still getting some cardio benefit from zone two. Uh, but again, if you're training longer distance stuff like a marathon, that's where it's going to be your legs that are holding you back rather than your, your cardio system. So the zone two works so good to just let you let yourself stack on all those miles. For somebody's like first marathon, I know it depends on where people are starting, but how long do you think somebody should give themselves before they're like, I'm going to tackle a marathon? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, there's probably general ideas for that. Yeah, I would say minimum four months. Minimum um, four months. And I mean, if you really ask me, I, I think anybody can go finish a marathon. Like it might take them 10 hours, but they could go from point A to point B, 26 mm -hmm. miles. Uh, I, I think if you want to get through a marathon and, Unscathed. and not, yeah, mm -hmm. not have injuries yeah. and not turn it into a big suffer fest, I would say minimum <laughs> four months. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I think if you're really trying to optimize, like if you're going from the couch to a marathon, probably like six months. And that's, that you probably safely do that, I think. But again, it's so subjective depending on, like if you played sports growing up, you're already healthy, you're yeah. already active but you don't run at all and you're trying to run your first marathon, you probably mm -hmm. get away with four months, I think. Sometimes it's super helpful for people to have that, you know, such a harsh goal. You know, they're going from the couch. Uh, they heard a marathon's coming up. Somebody teased them about their weight or something at Christmas time and they're pissed and they're like, fuck it, man, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, I'm going to do this thing. And sometimes it does motivate and it, it helps someone lose 40 pounds and they go do this marathon. But it's kind of rare. It's really rare to see that actually be a pivot point for somebody where it really turns around their life, you know, where they're like, yeah, I did this thing. And in six weeks I lost 40 pounds. And then I did this marathon and it all started back then. And now I'm running, you know, eight minute mile clips for, you know, hundred miles. Like it's really, really rare. You don't really hear people. Uh, that's not usually like the origin story. And the reason is, is like a lot of people when they commit to something like that, they usually fall off because, yeah. uh, the suffer fest that they had to go through was so demanding that they just were like, I'm probably not going to really ever do that again. Maybe they get hurt, unfortunately. And then the next thing you know, they're not really following their diet the same. They're not exercising at all anymore. And just it's like, man, like that yeah. was a cool idea. And it was great that you got fired up and excited for that. But maybe the full marathon <laughs> wasn't a great place mm -hmm. to start. Maybe a 5K, 10K. If you don't have much running experience, why don't we just sign up for some sort of run rather yeah. than a marathon? Yeah, I think that's why a lot of people say they don't like running is because they they probably try to do too much too fast. They see people on Instagram running marathons or half marathons, and if you if you go straight off the couch, like it's going to be miserable because your your body's just not used to that. And Thirty so, seconds. Yeah. Thirty seconds is tough. Yeah. If you haven't run and you and you run and you start running and you're actually trying to move like fairly quickly for 30 <laughs> seconds or so, you're like, I'm garbage. I can't believe I can't breathe. I can't believe my shins and calves are already lit up. Yeah. If, if you take long for some people. Yeah. If you, uh, 
Yeah, I, I think the obviously the smartest approach is just to start really slow, just like you did. I mean, either you're going to get mentally burnt out or you're going to get injured, basically, if, if you go out too fast and, and go out and try and do way too much. And Yeah, walk run is what I always recommend. Yeah, I think you said the same thing. Yeah, I think the walk run is the number one thing you can do as a new runner. And it's going to be so boring, but it's going to allow you to enjoy it more. You can show up and do it every day. You're not going to get injured. Um yeah, because running it's just such a high impact, repetitive activity that if you don't grow up doing it, like you're more often than not going to get injured if you don't really take a slow, methodical approach to it. So, yeah, I, I think playing the long game and just really easing into it is uh, is probably the number one thing you can do. Improving your sleep quality is as easy as shutting your mouth, and what I mean by that is putting some tape on, breathing through your nose will increase your sleep quality. It's no longer just something that only the bros do. It's now been researched and people understand that if you can breathe through your nose while you're asleep, you will have better sleep quality and you will wake up more rested. Hasha tape is also really awesome because I know what I used to do. I used to use a little bit of a cheaper tape and every time I'd wake up in the morning, the tape would be somewhere else on the bed or on my face, but it wouldn't be on my mouth anymore. But Hasha tape, if you have a beard or if you don't, will stay comfortably on your mouth all through the night. And if you're someone who has a problem breathing through your nose, Hostage also has nose strips. So you can place those on your nose while you're asleep. Or if you want to be like one of those hormosy guys, you can wear it during the day. <laughs> Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at hostagetape.com slash power project, where you guys will receive an entire year supply of mouth tape and the nose strips for less than a dollar a night. Again, that's over at hostagetape.com slash power project. Links in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Think you can carry that uh, seventy-two pound rock up the hill that Cam Haynes does faster than Andrew Huberman did? Uh, dude, uh, Huberman's a freaking beast, man. I don't know if I could beat him. He's a stud. I would love to try that sometime, though. I I've been following Cam for a while. He said it was brutal. I didn't realize the thing weighed seventy-two pounds. That's heavy. Wow. That's heavy. I, I was like, oh, that's like you know, thirty-four, which is still. I thought it was like thirty or forty pounds. His son Truett has. Uh, he just put out this challenge a couple weeks ago. Um, he just, I can't remember what he called it, like the 100 mile carry or the, the 100 mile, or sorry, the 100 pound mile. Um, and you basically just pick any device that weighs 100 pounds. You could put a you know, weight vest on and then carry some dumbbells or something. However, you want to carry 100 pounds and just how fast can you cover a mile? I've been wanting to test that out. He did it like uh, with a 100 pound sandbag, but um, 100 pounds yeah. for a mile. Yeah. That's cool. I'd be really interested to see how quick I can. I know uh, <laughs> our buddy, uh, Ben Alderman, um, he did the Iron Mile and he actually ended up naming his gym Iron Mile because I, I gave him this uh, like yoke walk thing that we have in the gym. I let him borrow it for a year or so and he ended up doing a, like a full mile with it. I forget how much <laughs> weight he had on there, but he called it the Iron Mile and I always thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested. I think it took him, I think it true it took him maybe like 20 minutes or something like that. That's Wow. That's impressive because yeah. like even just doing a regular mile on, in under 20 minutes is pretty good clip, pretty yeah, good pace. I mean, be able to, to walk that fast. Yeah. I mean, you got to really power walk to break 20 or wow. maybe like 17, 18 minutes if you're power walking. But mm -hmm. I think that's something I could actually try. Yeah. We'll Some stuff that this. people try that, that's kind of wacky. I'm like, I don't think I'm going to try that. But that actually doesn't sound too far out of my wheelhouse. Yeah. Anymore. I mean, you could. I guess you could kind of game it and and make it easier. Like you could put ankle weights on, and yeah. <laughs> like yeah, evenly yeah, distribute yeah. the weight. But <laughs> ankle it, weights would suck. Dog. Yeah, <laughs> fucking having to pick up your feet. That's Ooh. true. Ooh. I mean, I think if you're gonna do it the raw way, you'd probably want to just pick one device mm -hmm. that weighs 100 pounds mm -hmm. and just carry it from from point A to point B. Fucking walk around with a hundred pound dumbbell. <laughs> yeah. That'd be hard. Oh, just one. Yeah. Maybe two. F anyway, yeah, I don't know. Um, but for for somebody that is going from the couch to, I want to get into running. What should they have in mind? Should it be like just consistently showing up a couple times a week? Um, for me, and I, I don't know if this was the right approach. It was like I just want to be able to start running and not stop until I hit a mile. And when I didn't accomplish that, it was like, oh, running's not for me. Like this sucks. <laughs> And then if I had somebody early on, like Mark saying, oh, just run, walk, I'd probably get too bored, right. right? But if maybe I was like, hey, you should focus on this instead, like what should that be? Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the, the best ways to get through that boredom is to sign up for a race. Uh, it doesn't need to be a, a marathon or half marathon, but maybe a 5K, 10K. Like having some goal to work towards, I think helps a lot because if you have that, that external motivation, I mm -hmm. think that can help people get through the boredom phase because you... There's there's plenty of days you probably don't want to show up. There's plenty of days I don't want to show up. But if you have that goal you're working mm -hmm. towards, I think that helps. Um, yeah, 
I mean, running, it's a pretty boring activity when you think about it. Like, there's just not a lot of mental stimulus. Yeah. And so... Solitary. Yeah, I think uh-huh. running with people can help a lot, too, mm-hmm. uh, to maybe fight that solitude if, if you're not ready for that. Uh, like, run groups. Like, I lead a run group in Austin, and we get, like, 150 people out there every Wednesday. And That's most cool. people only run at that run group one time a week. But it's cool because they can go out, they can get some miles in, and they're with people. So you don't have to think about running as much. It's more social, <laughs> which is cool. Um, yeah, and then... Maybe music could help some people. Uh, I mean, that's where I started. I, I had to listen to music at, or put on a Goggins podcast and hear him call me a little bitch for an hour. <laughs> that's the only way I could get through a run. So but you really like Goggins, huh? I'm a big Goggins guy. Okay. I mean, he. I think he serves as good motivation. Yeah. I don't listen to him as much anymore because I, I don't feel like I need the motivation. But like, he got me off the couch. He got me to start running. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's that's uh, that's a purpose he serves for I a lot of people. I think he's brilliant. You know, like oh. when he was talking with uh, Huberman, um, He's just sitting there with a big old smile on his face because Huberman's yeah. telling him all this like research he found, and <laughs> Goggins is like, "Yep, okay, cool. Like that's what I've been doing. He that's li- exactly what I've been saying for the last five years." Yeah. He lived it. He like, yeah, yeah. He did it without the science, I guess. He just the just walk, walking proof of it, basically. Yeah, I mean that guy. I, I don't know how his body hasn't totally broken down <laughs> from all the shit he's done. Yeah. I mean, he always had like knee replacements mm-hmm. and all this stuff, but. Um, I think it just shows the power of your mind, I guess. The fluid drain stuff, man. Yeah, that stuff's wild. Yeah. Pulling out like syringes of mm-hmm. liquid out of his knee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. gross. Yeah. yeah. There yeah. was uh, the, the video I had pulled up earlier. It seemed like you were testing out like a VO2 max, like machine versus a wearable. Yeah. Uh, what were the results with that? Yeah, so before the lab test, my watch said 57. And then... The lab result was 69. So there's a pretty big Whoa. discrepancy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I think normally they're relatively accurate. I don't know why mine was so far off. Um, but normally they're pretty accurate within like, I think plus or minus three points typically, which is which is cool. But uh, yeah, mine was really far off. Mm-hmm. So 69 was like, uh, I think that puts me in like close to elite or near elite, which is pretty cool. Um, and I mean, if you plug that into like, race predictor calculators that, that put me like a 230 marathon you would say you were saying you were speculating that it might be off just because you kind of went nuts yeah yeah for I mean, the test like I you almost kinda, passed you out. sold out you went all in yeah i think that's a big part of it like <laughs> yeah. on a workout on the track like i'll never go to where i'm about to pass out um but there like there's people there it was controlled <laughs> environment like i you think you think i knew if i you. did pass out like there'd be people there to catch me or something um, and they had an, an AED on the wall too. So like, you know, could have oh revived me if needed. But um, yeah. yeah, I told myself before the test, I was like, okay, I'm going to go. I want, really want to try and find my limit. I just want to go as hard as I can. Uh, and towards the end, my vision started like tunneling. It was all like black. Like I, all I could see was the time on the treadmill. And I Ooh. felt my body start like drifting backwards. And I was like, oh, I had to like come back to and like hit the hit the stop button. But I, I never pushed that hard before. So that could be why um, it was so much higher than my watch. What do you think's wrong with you? I was going <laughs> to say, <laughs> right? This guy is like so unassuming. He's like so chill and he's just saying this shit. I'm like, what? Yeah, you can't get that shit from a Goggins podcast, dude. <laughs> like that's built in. Yeah, where's your, where's your dad at? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's actually a good question. <laughs> <laughs> No, hey, we're just saying we found the answer. Got it. <laughs> no, I think I mean, we were talking about that earlier. Like, I think uh, having some kind of trauma in your childhood or some sort of like hardships right. in your real life, I think it's almost necessary to be a good athlete. Can be a superpower in mm-hmm. some way, even though it may have been painful. Yeah, hundred percent. Because it's like not to go too deep down that, but anything that I would experience running, like I'm there by choice, and it's all voluntary. I have full control over it. Like that pain or discomfort would never match some real trauma in life that's out of your control, mm-hmm. in my opinion. So like, uh, yeah, like my dad, I, he was definitely like psychologically abusive at times, and mm-hmm. like, and my mom got divorced. It was like a super nasty divorce. This was like eight years ago, and there's still shit going on from that. So mm-hmm. like, having like, I mean, everybody's parents gets divorced. If it, it seems like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're like, I got nothing to complain about. Yeah, I mean, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like I'm. It's a good it still sucks though. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's a good it's a good perspective though, and and I I like your perspective because you're right. Other people have dealt with this and have not melted down. So how do I how do I find this? Other people have been dealt the same cards. Other people have been dealt worse cards, yeah. and they've done better or the same. Some people do worse, right? So yeah. it's like 
you still have an opportunity to figure things yeah. out, right? It's all about perspective. Right. And, and I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I've always thought of it as like a reverse role model. I think, I think. Oh yeah, I've heard Chris Williamson talk about that on his podcast as, before. Yeah. I, and yeah, I, I heard him say that not long ago. And um, I feel like I've kind of thought of it in that way. I just never. I've had it. a bunch of those. <laughs> I know, yeah, I never knew how to put it into words, but that's exactly what it is. <laughs> I, obviously, I think. A lot of people have role models or you should have role models, but mm. I think a reverse role model is almost just as important or, or just as powerful. It's like more blatant. It's easier to see. Like, I don't want to be anything like that. Yeah. Like you see somebody doing something that you see where that got them. You're like, I'm going to avoid that at all costs. I don't know what the right thing to do is necessarily, but I just know I'm not going to do that. So that's, that's a way I've kind of interpreted that situation. And I think that that definitely has played a role in the endurance side of things because mm. it's, Again, it's comparing these different discomforts. It's like I'm running because it's voluntary, and I'm choosing to be there. So I call my dad today and tell him to fuck off. <laughs> I want to see like what kind of you know performance enhancement I can get out of this. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, Doesn't he to have him. to be the ones that tell you to fuck off? Yeah, you <laughs> have, you can't do that to him. <laughs> oh shit! Okay, yeah. yeah, maybe you gotta make up something or tell him like, hey, dad, can you just like pretend to be a piece of shit so that way like I can like use that as motivation to improve? Maybe that'll work. I need something. The new <laughs> performance enhancing drug. <laughs> I can't just call him up and yell at him. That doesn't work that way. I, I think that I think he has to. It's you, Doug. Damn. <laughs> Maybe we can get you a cameo where somebody can just be mean to you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, tell me about this uh like lab testing. Like, so you did you did a VO2 max, but you were also doing things where you're testing like your stride and yeah. Do you find some of that to be valuable? Do you think that's something that maybe people should consider? Yeah, definitely. I think the VO2 max, I got so much out of that. Um, we did like a resting metabolic rate, which was cool. So I know my maintenance calories to, to main, maintain weight or lose oh, weight. Oh, they were telling you like when you burn carbs and fats and all that kind of stuff too, I right? think that's one of the most important things I got out of that was uh, at any point in time, they could look at what percentage uh, carbs versus fat my body was using for fuel. And so typically like, Zone two or under, you're majority fat. And once you get above zone two, you're primarily carb burning. Um, and I learned through that that even to the point to exhaustion where I, I had to, to the point of failure, my body was still using fat. Uh, not majority, but it was like maybe five, 10%. And they told me that it's like super rare to have that, that most people, once they get into like zone four, zone five, they're a hundred percent carbs, hundred percent anaerobic. Mm. But I think it has to do with, I eat a pretty high fat diet, like mostly animal based. Uh, so lots of fats. And then uh, I've trained anytime doing zone two easy runs, it's always fasted. Uh, and I do a lot of intermittent fasting. So like won't eat till noon most days. And uh, I think there's definitely something to just getting your body more fat adapted. Um, so like when I did that marathon, uh, I, I only took three gels throughout the whole thing, which on paper, I should have probably had like five or six. So close to double the gels, uh, the carbs. And I never bonked, didn't have any issues, never hit the wall, never had carb depletion. The gels have what in them? Uh, each one has about 20 grams of carbs. Um, so oh, wow, that's so much. Yeah, so you need to take them consistent, like every 30 minutes or so. And Some I, of them are really weird too. Yeah, they're strange. It's like someone just jizzed in your mouth <laughs> <laughs> while you're running. That's actually yeah. why I take them. <laughs> I was yeah. say, you got like, like a, a great. Like, These are great. <laughs> like, I have one every 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what flavor is this one again? <laughs> the consistency is like, you're like, man, I don't know about yeah. that. <laughs> this is a lot. <laughs> All right, so carbs and fats. Uh, yeah, carbs and that. fats. Uh, yeah, which is, I, that's why it kind of re reassured me that I should keep training. Uh, There's like more low carb approach and, mm. and like incorporating the higher fat diet. and, and the You don't normally eat a lot of carbohydrate? If I'm training for something fast, I'll eat more, like a, like a marathon or shorter mm. where I need the carbs. But even then it's very limited and it's only around workouts every, every, every other time. Or like on a regular basis, it's it's just low low carb, higher fat, basically. Under a hundred? Uh, yeah, usually under 100, 100 grams yeah. of carbs. Um, and then if it's around a workout, I'll bump it up to like closer to two hundred, probably. Uh, before a race, it's six hundred grams of carbs per day for three oh, days. Wow. It's an insane amount of carbs. Load. Yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah. Trying to load up, trying to get uh, carb glycogen loading. stores up as high as possible. Does it? Yep. Does that ever make you feel like? too full or anything like that or not really? I try to do it. So uh, it's a three-day carb load. So say the race is Sunday, I'll, I'll start Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then uh, the first two days, I'll stick to like the heavier stuff like a pasta or rice or things that are a little bit more uh, 
filling, I guess, satiating. And then like the day before the race, I'll do mostly fruit or just honey syrups, things that are like a lot lighter on on your system. So uh, yeah, the carb loading definitely works. I think that, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's like 15 to 20% performance increase mm. for a marathon for carb loading versus not carb loading. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think it makes a huge difference. My first marathon I did, it, I didn't carb load. I had like fucking salmon the night before because <laughs> I didn't know anything. It's like, oh, I eat this before all my long runs, so I'll just eat this the night before a marathon. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. And the cool thing with carb loading too, is it's, it's almost, it's like a battery, your glycogen system, instead of like a gas tank. Like you can't just show up the night before, eat a bunch of pasta and be good to go. It takes days to kind of charge it up or to top up those stores. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I use this online calculator. They just plug in your, your height, weight, age, your like race time, and then it'll spit out how many carbs you should eat. And for me, it's around 600 per day for those three days. Do you remember what it's called? It's, uh, it's on Featherstone Nutrition. Okay. Yeah. She's like a dietitian. Um, it's a great website. Yeah. And then the Run Lab. And then Run Lab. Yeah. So that's a, a spot in Austin. I think they got a few other locations throughout the US, but they bring you in, they put you on a treadmill. Uh, they'll have you run like your everyday easy pace. They'll film you. There's like a green screen. And then uh, they'll have you do whatever race you're training for. So for me at the time, it was a marathon. So they had me run at my marathon pace to try and make sure that's the most efficient. And they'll, they'll look at uh, kind of two things. Yeah, that's the carb loading website. Um, nice. But they'll have you, uh, so they'll have you do two different speeds, like your, your easy run and then your race pace. Uh, and they're looking at one, how can you optimize your performance, like become the most efficient runner, but mm -hmm. then also how can you reduce your risk of injury? Uh, like maybe you have some weird thing in your gait where like you're stepping on your heel too much or you're your like knees way out of line or something. And that's going to probably cause an injury over time. And so they, they helped me a lot. Um, fortunately, they said that my stride was like 99% good, which is cool. <laughs> wow. Um, and that's great. Yeah, they said that there was really nothing I could do. You're like, maybe I should be running this fucking lap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why don't you get on the treadmill? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so that was cool. Uh, yeah. They said that I really didn't have any kind of risk of injury anything that they noticed that would cause a risk of injury mm -hmm. uh but there were like two things i could do to like boost my efficiency and like maybe optimize their performance so the one of them was um they said my foot was like lingering too long behind me and my like the back of my stride and i needed to just like snap it around a little bit quicker and then the other one which i guess is part of that was like focusing on driving my knees forward a little bit more so now i, I consciously think of that not every run, but like when I'm running faster, um, I'll occasionally just kind of think about that for a couple of seconds. Okay, like drive my knees forward, like snap my foot back around a little bit quicker. So yeah, I think stuff like that's super helpful because running form, uh, obviously there's not one right way to do it necessarily, but there's a lot of wrong ways to do it. And so going into a place like that, or even, you know, have your friend take a video of you running and you're probably doing something that looks kind of funky or a lot of people would be. Um, and so finding those little inefficiencies and just optimizing that. But I think more than anything, when it comes to running form, it's just, just do it feels natural. Everybody's body mechanics are a little bit different. Our anatomy is a little bit different. And I think really the, the best way to optimize your form is just to run more. Like my form for sure has changed from when I first started five years ago. Like it's way more efficient now. Uh, just I can feel it. If I see videos of myself running, I know it looks better. Um, and that's another good point too, is like if it looks good, it usually is pretty good. And if it looks like something weird's going on with your form, then there's probably something you need to adjust. So even simply just looking at it, and if it, if it looks good, like you're probably on the right track. Nothing, let me ask this, because having 99% running form is pretty wild, but like from when you started to now, what are some of the big conscious changes you made to your gait, the way that you run? Mm. I think I have, my hips are like more outset and like you talked about this this morning where like it almost feels like your feet, like your toes are pointed out a little bit when you run. And if I see videos of myself, especially when I get tired towards the end of a run, my feet start to, to stray outward. My okay. toes start pointing out. Um, and so I try to consciously bring my toes in more and like just be more two-dimensional like this and not get too far out of that plane. Um, and so I try to think of that. Um, yeah, I think the the cadence is probably one of the biggest things mm -hmm. is just trying to have like a short, fast cadence, like not trying to overreach with my stride. Uh, like, so my easy run cadence is around 180 beats per minute. And then even at my marathon pace where I'm running three minutes a mile faster, my cadence is still about 180. So it's the same amount of steps per minute, 
It just one's a little bit shorter, choppier steps on the easy runs, and then one's a little bit more extended uh, on the faster pace. But yeah, I think cadence is huge because uh, it it just teaches you to like kind of utilize those those like faster twitch muscle fibers. Because mm-hmm. um, if you're just always running at like 120 steps per minute or something, it's like you're just you're spending so much time on the ground, and the more time you spend on the ground, the slower you're going to run. Yeah, and the more yeah, you're impact. very you're very like bouncy and poppy. Right, it's yeah. intentional. Athletic. Yeah. I don't I don't have to think of it anymore as much but when i first started running i remember uh my cadence was like 140 150 it was way lower and so i i started consciously every run just like okay just take shorter choppier steps be up on my toes a little bit more and then now i don't really have to think about it and it's it's just kind of more subconscious was yeah. it kind of hard at first oh definitely yeah, yeah. I, I had to really consciously think about it takes a lot of energy kind of to like pop yourself off the ground a little because it's not just choppier steps it's you're literally hopping off the ground a little quicker Right. The entire time. Yeah, I mean, running is just jumping, really, when you think about yeah. it. like, So you're jumping more per minute, you know, 140 times versus 180 times. You're jumping 40 more times. Right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it just takes more energy. But over time, again, you're spending less time on the ground, even though you're taking more steps. Um, and it's just, it's more efficient that way. And uh, yeah, because every time your foot hits the ground, you're breaking. Um, or, or the more time you spend on the ground, uh, you're breaking. And so the quicker you can get off the ground, the, the less you'll have that breaking effect, basically. Gotcha. Andrew, you were mes- mentioning earlier about like being bored, you know, somebody go out, going out on a run and they, you know, might kind of think running is not for them. They try running and they feel tired. Um, they try like a jog walk and the intensity is too low and they're like, this is stupid, you know, it's <laughs> dumb, it's not fun. I try to be creative with it, you know. Um, try to find somewhere where you can maybe run some stairs or run some hills, Um it doesn't have to, no one's saying that you have to go run like X amount of miles, but I do think that we could all agree, like it's good to sort of race your body. You know, it's good to like figure out some ways to like move your body through space, whether it's jumping or whether it's running, um, maybe a little bit of hill sprints, maybe uh, some stairs. I can even just think certain areas that I go, um, I might be jogging and then boom, I'll pop up some stairs and then I might hit like a little bit of a sprint. And then I might chill. Like sometimes I do that like on, just on a walk. So you might find it more fun to just open up the playbook a bunch and almost like parkour your walk <laughs> and say, I'm going to, every time I see a bench, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump on the bench 10 times. Uh, and every time I see the bench, I'm going to, you know, do a angled push up on the bench for some reps. And then, you know, you just continue onward and just like make shit up and you can have a lot of fun. You mentioned step ups. Uh, I do step ups pretty often, like just on a run. I just see something that I can do a step up on, and I'm just like, uh, I do a lot of times on walks and things like that. So just, you know, be creative and start to think about more movement. Maybe even run backwards, run sideways. Like, why not just really, really mix it up? And if you can get some of that in a couple times a week, shit to me, like that's that's great. I don't think people necessarily have to run. I think running can be really beneficial. I think some of the zone two stuff that we talk about is can be really important for people. But even just what I just mentioned now, I think would be huge for people, especially if you consider the fact that they're getting outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, if your if your goal is to be as healthy as possible, live as long as possible, like VO two max is probably one of the best metrics you can follow. And uh, obviously, running is just a tool to increase that VO2 max. I mean, you can row, you can swim, you can bike. Uh, but I think one of the cool things with running is, like, you don't really need equipment. You just need some shoes. You can go out and run. You get, you're outside. It's easy to meet up with people. Like, you can do it anywhere. Like, one of my favorite things is traveling and, and being able to go for a run somewhere. Like, even coming here to Sacramento for the first time, like, even in this industrial park, I was like, oh, I'm running somewhere new. It's kind of fun. Uh, and you get to explore something or, like, we went to like, Europe last year and I got to run through like the mountains in Switzerland Oof, every morning. I was like, damn, like I, it always makes me feel so uh, appreciative and grateful that like I have the ability and the the capacity to just be able to go for like a five mile run. It's a great way to see a town or a city. It really is. Yeah. I mean, cause you're, you're going to see things that you wouldn't see in a car. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're exploring a place on foot and you can run by people and feel better than them. Cause they're sitting down eating a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> Look at all you fat bastards. <laughs> yeah. Just be all judgy. So let's say that you've already gotten your blood work done with Merrick Health. You've gotten the right supplementation. You've handled your nutrition. But how about the people 
close to you? How about the people in your life? Recently, I had my mom get her blood work done with Merrick Health, and she's gotten her blood work done many times in the past. But Merrick did an amazing job at looking at her blood work and giving her the supplement ideas to help her move forward. Because one thing is, is when you go to hospitals and they get your blood work and they do your blood work, when they look at your numbers, they're comparing you to the average person. They're not trying to optimize you and help you move forward. They're just trying to make sure that you're not breaking. Whereas Merrick Health, when their patient care coordinators look at your blood work and when they looked at my mom's, they're trying to figure out how to optimize you and make you live the most vital life possible. So if you've gotten your blood work done, great. But think about the people close to you. Would it be good for them to get their blood work done and get this type of work done? If so, Andrew, how can they get in contact with Merrick Health? Yes, yeah, super important stuff, guys. Head over to MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off the Power Project panel, the Power Project checkup panel, or any lab that you select on their website. Again, MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah. Um, shoes can be motivating, right? Like you buy a new pair of shoes and like, I'm going to go use these shoes to go running now. Yeah, 100%. Um, any shoe recommendations? Like what do you use? Oh, I kind of run in everything. Mm -hmm. um, one of the obviously benefits of being a creator in the running space is all the running brands send me just free stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I have probably like 50 pairs of shoes, way too many, <laughs> but they're all from different brands. Uh, and in my opinion, like, they're all kind of the same. Like, I, I have some preferences, uh, especially like the carbon-plated shoes. What were the ones I was wearing today? You had those sent to me. I appreciate that. Yeah, those, the uh, the New Balance. Uh, I think they're the SC Elites, like Super Comp Elites or and something. And you can get those for, for people with chubby feet. You can get those wide, and those yeah. were— those are great. So like some dad shoes, uh, you know, that are, that also have a carbon <laughs> foot plate in them. Yeah. The carbon plate is crazy. It, it's probably like lifting with, uh, like powerlifting gear. I'm yeah. sure it, it makes a huge difference. Like if you're trying to run a fast marathon without carbon plated shoes, you're definitely leaving. Explain, explain a carbon plated shoe to someone who's never heard us, you know, never heard us talk about it oh, before. Man. Um, basically carbon fiber foot plate is like inserted into the middle of the foam underneath and, and like the sole of the shoe. Sure uh, look at that thing. That thing's, that thing's crazy. A monster. Yeah. Some of the shoes now are nuts. Uh, but basically that carbon plate in there, yeah. it's super lightweight. So the carbon fiber, but it's, it's like a spring almost. So it helps you spring forward. Yeah, if you try to bend it, you know, if you bend the shoe in half, it, it has this like energy to yeah, it. It'll snap back. It'll snap back. It can jump off the ground. If you push it down on the ground and, and it, let it go up, it will literally jump off the ground. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like, Corking a baseball bat almost. Yeah. It's like you, you add that springiness to it. I think for some folks that are um, heavier and not used to running, I think uh, I would strongly suggest that they look into something like that because I do think it is, I do think it makes that big of a difference that it's something that can just get you going. Yeah. Like for those that are really dead set on like running a couple of miles uh, right off the bat, they don't want to walk. They don't want to like take their time to get into it. Right. Get yourself a pair of shoes that are uh, with, that have a carbon footplate in them. Yeah, and I, and I will say I don't I don't know if I would run every day in them just because they are so stiff. I find that uh, it it makes my like lower legs a little bit more sore, or I feel it a little bit more in my feet or my lower calves just because they are so stiff. So when I'm doing all my easy runs, I'll just run in like a super cushion, soft mm -hmm. shoe without a carbon plate. Uh, and then when I want to go fast, I want to utilize that that like springiness. That's when I'll I'll use those, but. Yeah, I mean, if it works for you, like if you can run in them every day and it doesn't it doesn't affect you in any way, like I'd say go for it. But I do know a lot of people have issues if they wear them too much because of that mm -hmm. stiffness in there. But it, it almost feels like cheating sometimes. They're they're so fast. Like doing the same workout with a carbon plated shoe versus without, like you're gonna run faster without a doubt with the carbon plated shoe. And it's like that's lab tested too. I've noticed that I feel it less. Yeah. You know, so I can feel almost more miles a little bit less. In those shoes, that's the that's how big of a difference it can make. Yeah, I guess maybe one question for you: Like, would do you always like peak powerlifting? Did you lift with uh, powerlifting gear every time you'd lift, or did you use it kind of strategically? Um, in powerlifting, I wore the powerlifting gear a lot. Yeah, um, I would do a lot of warm ups and stuff, and I would push uh, raw without without the gear, but then I would put it on and do my main working sets there because it was the most important thing was to learn um, that equipment and to develop the strength and the skill set of that. But when it comes to running, um, I don't I don't wear the carbon footplate stuff uh, 
that often, but I, in the beginning, it was really helpful for me. Yeah, It really made a difference. I, I was just not conditioned enough to really get going with running. And it was uh, recommended to me by Ryan Hall, who holds some oh, he's uh, a beast. Yeah, all-time records. And I have just, I DM'd him. I was like, he probably won't respond to me. He's like an Olympian or whatever. Um, and he just said, yeah, you're a big boy. Like, go get, <laughs> go get a carbon footplate shoe. And yeah. even though they weren't comfortable and it wasn't necessarily great for my foot because my foot was sort of wedged in there a bit, I didn't mind the trade-off because I'm like, well, at least it gets me in this perpetual motion and I get to run on a consistent basis. Yeah, that, that's the biggest thing. Like, I mean, you can get so nitpicky with all these things like, yeah. oh, don't wear the carbon plates too much. But whatever gets you out the door to go for a run and allows you to, to come back the next day, like do whatever that thing is. Yeah. Yes. Uh, speaking of being nitpicky and, you know, getting kind of lost in the sauce, how about supplements? You know, because that's another thing that can be motivating. But if you're like oh, the only way I can do this four-mile run, whatever it may be, it's like, I have to have my thing. When in actuality, maybe that thing's not doing anything. But do you have any recommendations for supplements? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think you can feel like, oh, I can't go for my run without my gels or without my electrolytes. I and mean, you obviously can, but I think they're there to help you. Like, mm -hmm. if it's going to optimize your performance, I mean, why not? Um, right. Some of it could be placebo, but there are things. What about some of this stuff? What is that? This is good. This is your drink. Oh, switchback. Your electrolytes. Hydration. I mean, electrolytes, uh, yeah, it's sodium stores are sort of like your glycogen stores. Like is, if you're consistently taking electrolytes and sodium, you can get through most workouts without it, like intro workout, but you got to consistently be taking it. Um, one of my favorite products, it's uh, it's called Two Before. It's this New Zealand-based company, uh, and it's uh, black currant powder, which is a type of berry that they have in New Zealand. And you guys probably heard of the, the endurance benefits of like beet juice from like the nitrates. Yeah. Mm. It's similar to that, but it's like double. Like in the lab, it's been tested to be double the the performance benefits, which is cool. Wow. Um, it's literally just a berry in the powder form. Um, I take that most days. Uh, I also What's started it called again black a black currant. Black currant. Does it give you a current. boner? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I do get those. Yeah. yeah. But Why did you ask that? <laughs> Correlation, I, causation. I, I, uh, why I wouldn't know. I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't okay. attribute no, it. No, no. It, it, those products usually have like nitric oxide mm -hmm. right. impact and right. stuff like that. So uh, I didn't How about you, Mark? I've never tried it. No. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. um, Running with a boner, though, it could be a new thing. Yeah. You probably lose some blood flow to the rest of your legs, oh, though. Oh, yeah. So. Probably slow you down. Yeah. yeah. There's a little give and take to everything, guys. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Do you mess around with, like, uh, cold plunging? And uh, do you get any body work done, myofascial release, anything particular for recovery? Uh, I do cold plunge. I think more for the mental side of things, though. Like, I feel like, obviously, there, there are some benefits to the recovery, but I just like cold plunging because it makes me feel good. Uh, I, I think I've heard Huber Huberman talk about the dopamine release is like six hours or something crazy. Yeah, isn't that wild? <laughs> uh, I love doing that. And I also find that the first like 30 seconds of a cold plunge is almost identical to how you feel towards the end of a really hard effort, like a hard a marathon or something, uh, because it's that fight or flight response. <laughs> Like, you're so uncomfortable. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. But you have, you have to learn to, like, calm yourself down. Yeah. And like, oh, okay, we're fine. But, uh, yeah, I like doing it for that. Um, I think the number one thing for recovery, for me, is just active recovery. Like, I don't ever stretch. I don't foam roll. I don't I don't really don't do any myofascial release. Uh, I just walk a lot. I love walking. That's good. Yeah, we have two uh, golden retrievers. So, I'll walk them, like, 30 minutes once a day. Uh and just use that as a time to be outside, time to kind of meditate and I don't take my phone or anything. And uh, I think that the movement from walking helps a lot, just blood flow and it's so low impact. Uh, yeah, I always say motion is lotion. Mm -hmm. I love just like that feeling of just getting out and moving your body. Excuse Knees over that. toes type stuff. Do you mess around with anything like that? Uh, Do you try to implement range of motion in into some of your exercise? Um, Outside of like, Strength training, not really, no. I, I do, uh, like, reverse sled pulls as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that, would, you consider that knees over toes, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, specific knees over toes. Like not. a Jefferson curl or something, you know, these deadlifts where you're kind of cat backing mm -hmm. it or, or just trying to, you know, exceed, like, going down, you know, past your feet type thing. And um, I've never, I feel like I have pretty good 
mobility and like my yeah. posterior chain yeah. that's why i'm decent at deadlifting so i don't do a lot of that stuff um i could probably be better without a lot of that but i think i'm, I'm just so stubborn that i'd like well it sounds like you're <laughs> i mean look I, i'm i'm adding in like extra shit onto what you already do but you're you know i've seen your workouts and stuff before it looks like you're doing stuff with full range of motion it looks like you have good form and technique so there's really you know, uh, you know, if you were sitting there doing like these half reps and getting injured all the time and right. had this really tight, stiff body, then I would say, hey, you have to do it. Like, bro, like, listen, right. you know, take it from someone who is already tight and stiff. Like, this will really be helpful. But since you're already navigating it well, I don't think there's any reason to fuck with it at the moment. Right. It looks like you're doing well. Yeah, I mean, you could always be more flexible, more mobile. Right. It's it's like running. You can always go farther or faster. But uh, I guess for what I'm doing now, I don't, I don't know if I... Don't feel like I need it, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, whatever I'm doing now, it seems to be working. Um, but like, I'll do a yoga class occasionally with with my fiance, and like, I feel like I can do pretty good at those. Like, I'm relatively flexible. I mean, I can't like fucking put my foot behind my head or anything like that. But <laughs> I don't really need to do that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I feel like for whatever I'm doing now, I, I'm again, you could probably optimize. You can always optimize everything or optimize something. But um, yeah. Let me ask you, oh, real quick, uh, rewinding back to your 99% gait, right? How is it that your uh, foot strikes the ground? What What is it that you think about? Like, how does oh, it yeah. strike? Because we've asked a few different runners. Um, for example, Nick Bear said it's not even something he even thinks about, so he doesn't really know. But, but what is it with you? Yeah, I I think naturally the faster you run, the more up on your toes you're going to be. Because, mm -hmm. it, again, it's, it's like jumping. Yeah. Um, I really, I don't think about it a whole lot either, I guess. Uh, I do try to, like the cue I tell myself sometimes, or like a new runner is uh, landing on a bent knee with your, and the only way to actually do that is if your foot is directly under your body. Because uh, like you can't land on a bent knee if your foot's out in front of you. Like it's mm -hmm. just not, like it's <laughs> very, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so landing on a bent knee, which therefore like, if you looked at like my side profile when I'm running, my, as soon as my foot hits the ground, my hip would be perfectly parallel to my ankle, basically. Okay. And so trying to land, the goal is to land with your foot directly under your body because then that's, again, less time that your foot's on the ground. So it's, it's more efficient that way. Yeah. Uh, but like my actual foot strike would be like mid foot to like four foot, somewhere in that range. Um, okay. Yeah, the, really the only way to heel strike, and the reason that everybody talks about heel striking is just because your, your foot's out in front of you mm -hmm. and that just puts a lot of pressure on your knee and again, it's that breaking effect. Yeah. So, yeah, I think just trying to land on a bent knee with your foot directly underneath you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was it uh, being Nick Bear's cameraman, the thing that got you in shape? <laughs> <laughs> it definitely didn't hurt. <laughs> it definitely helped. Uh, I mean, trying to chase him around, probably difficult. Shit. Oh, I had a skateboard, so I don't have to do too much. Uh. <laughs> skateboard or a truck. But um, no, yeah, being around him and just seeing like how he operates is cool. Like he's just, he's by far the most consistent person I've ever seen. Like that's probably the biggest lesson I took away from, from being around him is he, he wakes up at like 5 a.m. every day. He goes for an hour, hour and a half long run. He's in the office. He eats the same food at the same time every day. He trains right after work, goes home, hangs out with his family. Like it, it's, I don't want to say robotic, but it's just like so consistent every mm -hmm. single day. And I think that's, that's the name of the game with fitness. What a boring guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the boring stuff is what works usually. Absolutely. Yeah, it's like the flashy shit. It's not sustainable usually. Right. So trying to find the most sustainable, consistent routine seems to be the, the best way to optimize fitness. So yeah, that was definitely what I took away from him was just be consistent, do the boring stuff. And just like, say, like even with him and his content, like he hasn't had like some big viral moment necessarily. Like his YouTube channel maybe has a couple videos that are over a million, but the vast majority are like a couple hundred thousand every single time, but it's consistent. He shows up every single week, a new YouTube video every single week. Mm -hmm. uh, so taking that same you know, philosophy from fitness or content, just applying that to everything else is to show up, do the boring stuff, just be consistent. It doesn't have to be some crazy flashy thing every time. That's, yeah, definitely learn that from him. I'm thinking about like when I got into like this fitness you know, thing, I guess I'll say. Um, this was like maybe about 10 or so years ago. Um, so I'm 38 now, so I would have been still a little bit older than you are right now. But I don't remember anybody my age really being into running. Like, I just remember all the memes of like, cardio is hardio, like, let's just go lift instead. So like lifting was like super popular. Um, are you finding that like running is getting way more popular amongst like younger people now? 
Oh, definitely. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I, I know the average age of marathon runners is like 40. It's like low 40s, like 42, 43 or something. But I think that's getting younger. Uh, and I think maybe a lot of it is just the, the patience that's required that a lot of young people don't have. But now it's social media and it's like becoming more mainstream and, oh, I can get some running content out of this and uh, I, I can make some fun videos. Like it kind of brings more excitement to it. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of like fashion involved with running because like people want to be wearing the nicest stuff and the cool shoes and how do you look the best. <laughs> so I feel like there's maybe an element of that that attracts a lot of young people. Mm. But uh, yeah, there, it's definitely more mainstream like it, i always thought runners were fucking weirdos <laughs> like <laughs> when i was in high school like i thought all the cross-country kids were just like these nerds With their tiny short shorts yeah <laughs> now i mean this morning i was wearing like two inch shorts yeah and, you know, bright colored shoes like, <laughs> yeah how do we get the zero inch <laughs> yeah you know what i mean like <laughs> I just want to why are these all shorts out there all so long <laughs> yeah. you know uh yeah i feel like it's becoming cooler though it's yeah like, it's like awesome it's more mainstream for sure i, I would imagine a lot of it's just social media it's like cold plunging. Like if you if you don't post about your cold plunge, did you actually cold plunge? Nope. Or if you if you went for a run and you didn't post your watch photo, did you actually go for a run? <laughs> it's yeah. Made me think of that video I sent you the other day where the, the guy was uh like celebrating. He's celebrating <laughs> and all the people were applauding and it's like the way that you think people are gonna react oh, to your I, cold plunging. I think I saw that video. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. He's it's great. Just, it's the same thing with running, like <laughs> I mean, I do this myself. Like if I, if I go run like 20 miles on a Saturday morning and then I go and hang out with friends, sometimes 20 like, miles this morning. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, <laughs> nobody you guys know what I did this morning. And like, or even you're just sitting there and you're like, man, these people don't know. I just ran 20 miles. <laughs> it's like it's such a weird thing, but it's a cool way to build confidence for yeah. yourself too. Cause yeah. you're going and doing something hard that the average person isn't it's doing. Not doing it. It'll so. get so much worse if you start jujitsu. That's right here. Cause you'll just look at a room. All right, guys, take you, a shot. None of you train. <laughs> Right, yeah, sorry. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I think it, we mentioned it twice already. We did. So, so I take your shots. next shot. <laughs> yeah, you guys are slacking. But yeah, anyway, I just wanted to throw it in there. Yeah, that's probably a cool feeling, knowing you can just choke any of us out right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he thinks about it often. <laughs> yeah. I've never met... Uh, I couldn't catch you, though. Uh, <laughs> I'll just outrun you. Give me 20 you. seconds. Yeah. I'm gonna, I can't catch you. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met a... Uh, Somebody that does jujitsu that's that's not like super nice, humble, yeah. Person I, again, you just got to meet more. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of J BJJ assholes, man. <laughs> there's a lot of them. Just well, like there's a lot, a lot of, of running assholes. Yeah, there's a lot true. of BJJ assholes. Well, and there's probably a lot of people that are still new to it, and maybe the gym or you know that they go to and where they train, maybe they don't have like the same culture, culture as everywhere yeah. else, right? Yeah. So yeah. it probably is highly dependent on some of that. Yeah. I've, I mean, there's got to be like a humbling aspect to it, right? Like if you get choked Seems out enough like times, it. yeah, like you're like, damn. Because that'll happen. Yeah. yeah, It happens to everybody. So like, yeah, most, I, I agree with you. Most people that get to a high level in jiu-jitsu are pretty cool. Yeah. But there's some assholes. <laughs> <laughs> like in everything. There's, there's assholes. assholes in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah running, running can be humbling, especially when you're first starting. Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah like, I suck at this. Yeah. Any new endeavor is that you're not used to get humbled real quickly. Anything you think you might try outside of the running street? Because obviously the 100 miler is coming up. I don't know what you may do after that. But is there anything that you're like, I might dabble? Mm. The high rock stuff seems pretty cool. Uh, Ooh, okay. And I feel like I could be decent at that because it's, uh, it's cardio-based but requires a little bit of strength. Mm -hmm. So that seems interesting. Ironmans seem kind of interesting. Swimming scares me. I'm not a good swimmer. Okay. Mm. No, you could be one. <laughs> I could, if, yeah. It would take some practice. I, I did uh, a sprint triathlon a couple years ago, mm. and um, I didn't drown, but I, mm -hmm. I definitely thought I was going to. Yeah. <laughs> so Ironmans seem fun. Uh, Ironmans are just so time consuming. Like it's like twenty hours a week of training. Yeah. But it, it would be a fun challenge, and I, I, I like that about stuff. Is uh, that's what I like pursuing. Is things mm -hmm. that are challenging and new. So I mean, this hundred mile, like. I really don't know if I have any desire to do anything past 100 miles. I have a friend, uh, he's 22, and he just did three 200-mile races this last summer. And wow. I, I'm like, I don't know if I have any desire to do that. It's like mm -hmm. five days of running with little to no sleep, mm -hmm. and I just don't know if I want to do that. I don't know what I'd get out of that past running 100 miles. Um, yeah, I mean, run, 100 miles, they call it life in a day because you experience yeah. all these ups and downs wow. that you'd experience in life and like through a lifetime and so uh, i'm excited for that but past that point how it, long does it take to go 100 miles it depends on the race and, and the terrain so like i mean somebody like zach bitter his 100 mile record <laughs> was on a track and that took like 11 hours i want to say mm, yeah 
<laughs> but this one I'm doing, it's through the mountains in Wyoming. So it's like 22,000 feet of gain and loss. So like Whoa. literally going up these giant mountains, like I can't run up that. Like, yeah, I mean, maybe like the most elite ultra marathon runners can run up mountains like that. You're going to have to walk a lot of this too. It's a lot of walking. Yeah. It's, there's like a joke within ultra running. That mm-hmm. It's it's just like ultra walking basically. Mm-hmm. And we call it power hiking. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's just walking. <laughs> well, it's a great place for people to start. Is to start with uh, like a trail run, not not a hundred yeah. miles, but a trail. Yeah. A trail run is a really good place for people to start because most people, especially if you're not like super athletic, you're going to kind of eyeball a lot of stuff and be like, "I'm just going to walk, and I don't want to roll my ankle." Yeah, you know, in these particular areas, I guess the hard part on that would just be to select the correct kind of pair of shoes or something like that. But yeah. That's actually where I started. Yeah. Uh, when I first got into running, it was on the road. But then after a year, when we uh, when we moved back to Wyoming, it was like all in the trails, all in the mountains. Um, so the first like two to three years was pretty much all trail running, which was cool. Mm. Uh, and I think it it like it teaches you that it's okay to walk. Like you come up on a big hill, you're probably not going to run up that, and it's okay to walk, uh, which is cool. And and you build up. It's more a uh, natural way to run. I think like I don't I don't know if people are really built to run on concrete. Mm. But being on trails, like people have always been on trails and in in the mountains and stuff. So it's a more natural way to run, I think. And just again being okay with that run to walk thing. It's it's you have more of an excuse to walk, I think. The uh barefoot sprinter. He's a little weird, isn't he? <laughs> he's an interesting guy. Yeah. <laughs> you got a chance to run with him yesterday? Yeah, yeah. He hopped in for a few reps. And uh was he doing your workout or you were doing his workout? Uh he did mine. So I was oh, doing cool. I was in four hundred meter repeats. Oh, there it is. He's pretty fast. He yeah, he kept up. That was like that's like five minute pace, five ten pace. Um, you how many sets did you guys do? I did ten total. He did like three or four with me. I think. Nice. He, he kept up. Uh, yeah. At one point, he's like, "This is above my aerobic capacity <laughs> or something." <laughs> but that's exactly uh, what he would say. You no know, interesting thing. <laughs> yeah, you can see the it. the difference in the cadence <clears throat> and me. Like mine. Oh yeah. My steps are a lot shorter and faster. Mm-hmm. His are a little bit more extended, which is, I don't know if that's due to just like mechanics or maybe the fact that he's barefoot or something. Mm. Um, but you can, it's like a pretty clear difference uh, in our step count, which is interesting. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't run barefoot at all. You were doing 400s or 800s? 400s. So just, just. And then what was your time? Uh, so that's like a minute. Each one was like a minute 15. Okay. So yeah, it's, uh, it was like 510 pace on average. Uh, what, uh, what's your best on that? On a 400 meter? Yeah, do you have a PR? I, so I did track in high school for one year. Uh, my my uncle was the track coach and he talked me into doing it and I just picked the shortest distance possible, which is the 100, the 200, and the 400. We had to pick three events. Uh, it was like three month track season. I fucking, I hated it so much. Uh, but I ran a 53 second wow. uh, 400. Um, but even at, like the training for that, like we never ran over a mile. Mm-hmm. So it was like, it was always just really short distance sprints. Um yeah, so 53 seconds uh, for the 400 in high school. So not bad. Um, I, I didn't like go to state or anything like that, mm-hmm. but um, it was like decent for our team, I think. It's impressive. Yeah. Are you going to have to prepare yourself at all for the elevation that for that race coming up? Are you going to do anything? Or are you just going to do miles wherever you are in Austin and then go do yeah, the Yeah, that's a real challenging part about those mountainous ultra, ultras is uh, living not in the mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I'll probably, there's one hill in Austin. Uh, it's called the Hill of Life. And it's like this half mile hill yeah. and it's on a trail. Uh, last year when I was training for my 50 miler, I uh, I would do repeats on that. Um, just like three hours, just on this half mile hill. Mm-hmm. I'd hike up it. I'd run back down, hike up it, run back down. I did like 20 repeats. So I'll do a lot of that. Um, and then I, I'd work out at home. I just have a home gym. So I don't have a treadmill. So I've been considering uh, just getting a gym membership to simulate that hiking aspect to just, just go spend some time on a treadmill or just buying a treadmill for my house. But I hate the treadmill and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on there. Yeah. Uh, but I might have to for that aspect. Uh, and then also like weighted vests. I have a 20 pound weight vest that I'll, I'll wear as much as I can just walking around or even during my strength workouts, throw that on. Because mm-hmm. um, like when, when you're running trails, like you have to carry water, you got to wear, or you got to wear a uh, pack with snacks and all this stuff. And so like that adds... Not 20 pounds, but like maybe five, 10 pounds. So yeah. getting used to just having some kind of load. Uh, and then, yeah, a lot of just volume, basically. Like, I think there is something to just being fit in general mm-hmm. that will translate to something like that. Um, but like race-specific training, I'll try and do as much uh, incline as I can. So the Hill of Life, I'll just do repeats on that for like three, four hours. 
<laughs> which is terrible, yeah. but yeah. Got to do it. You have your own podcast? Yes. Yeah. And what's the name of that? The Jeremy Miller Podcast. Yeah, I started that uh, less than a year ago, about eight months ago. Um, yeah, it's all just interviewing guests, very similar setup to this, uh, to try and find interesting people to interview, whether it's in the health and fitness or not. I just I like talking to interesting people, mm -hmm. seeing uh, everybody's story and, and just gaining that new perspective, which has been fun. There's a lot of people in Austin. There's a lot of runners down there. So it probably yeah. makes it uh, fairly easy for you to grab some runners here and there to yeah. do the show, right? Yeah. One of my favorite guests, his name's uh, Mitch Ammons. He's uh, an Olympic trials qualifier, uh, which that's this weekend, actually, in Orlando, the Olympic trials. Sure. Um, but he lives in Austin. He was like a heroin addict. He smoked a pack of cigarettes a day, like mm. super unfit, wow. the furthest thing from an athlete. What's and his name? His name's Mitch Ammons. He's, he's such a good dude. Like one of the nicest people I've ever met. But he was like a hardcore drug addict. And now he runs like a 216 marathon. Which With is just, those lungs. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a pack of cigarettes a day and drinking. And I, I, he did all kinds of drugs and stuff. It was, mm. He's one of the most interesting and like nicest people I've ever met. Very um, cool. But by far, he's probably been my favorite guest just because he's got such a unique story. And um, yeah, I love, I love storytelling. I think that's fun. It's a huge advantage having a podcast. Yeah. You know, you get to learn so much from people. You have different different guests, different people with different perspectives, different backgrounds, and so on. Yeah, I was so afraid to start a podcast. Because I, I found Rogan, it's probably like 2016, 2017. And as soon as I heard his podcast and just realized, like, who's just a regular dude? He just has conversations with interesting people. I was like, it'd be so fun to have a podcast. But I was so scared because I've was i always been more, like, shy, reserved, like, mm -hmm. not very outward-facing. And then when I started doing more personal content, building more confidence, I was like, man, I could probably host a podcast and be able to have interesting conversations with people. Uh, but yeah, the networking aspect, like regardless if people listen or not, I don't give a shit. It's just like, <laughs> I like the conversation aspect. I'm mm -hmm. like, how often do you get to just sit down with somebody like this for an hour and a half, two hours and have like a good, deep, present conversation with somebody? Uh, it's so much fun. I love that aspect of it. Cool. Where can people find you? Uh, Jeremy Miller on Instagram. Uh, my website's jeremymiller.io, the Jeremy Miller podcast. And then uh, you can check out our electrolytes at a uh, switchback. So, These taste good, man. Thank you. I it love it. Good. good job. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I do um, some one-on-one -on -one coaching, a lot of content. Uh, so if you guys are into running or fitness at all, um, go check out my page. Try and, I try and be as informational as I can. Cool. Yeah. Good luck with the 100 miles. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sounds brutal. I might die but we'll see what happens yeah. <laughs> well, we'll clip that strength, oh, you'll be just fine. <laughs> strength is never a week this week this is never a strength catch you guys later bye if you guys enjoy this episode with jeremy miller i know you probably did you'll definitely enjoy this episode with mike dolce he's one of the top nutrition coaches for ufc fighters and there's a lot you'll get from this one especially if you have kids but even if you don't still a ton of knowledge in this one so click it <laughs>